and good evening to those of you in Europe and good morning to those of you awake in Australia. Welcome to session one of the ESIG 2021 Fall Technical Workshop. I hope you were able to turn into the keynote session we had on Tuesday with Warren Lasher from ERCOT and the great grid forming inverter panel, and I promise you another quite informative and educational session today. I'm Charlie Smith, the Executive Director of ESIG, and I'll provide a few brief opening remarks. As I think you know, we're a global member-based nonprofit organization providing objective technical information, resources, and networking opportunities in support of grid transformation and energy systems integration decisions. We do this through workshops, tutorials, webinars, blogs, working groups, and task forces for our members, and by producing technical resource materials and briefing materials for decision makers. Our workshop sessions are all being held online and are open to everyone. This workshop was planned with the input of our ESIG offerings committee, chaired by Bethany Frua Benrell and Julia Matoivasan of ERCOT. The committee consists of the chairs of our six working groups and several of our board members. We have a great set of volunteers who really make ESIG what it is, and we encourage you to become involved if you're not already. You can find us on the web at esig.energy, send an email to info at esig.energy to get our monthly newsletter, and follow our activities on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. ESIG also serves a leadership role in the Global Power System Transformation Consortium often called GPST, whose mission is to bring together key actors from around the world to catalyze a rapid, clean energy transition at unprecedented scope and scale. ESIG leads one of the five pillars that deals with the research agenda for the system operators. More information on GPST can be found at globalpst.org. In the workshop sessions this month, you'll see the range of issues that need our attention today. If you participate in our working groups and task forces, you'll be working with world-class domain experts on issues that need our attention tomorrow and will be on the agendas of our future workshops. As I mentioned a minute ago, ESIG is a member-based organization, and this is why your membership and your participation in ESIG are so important. Speaking of memberships, if you're the point of contact for your organization, please keep an eye out for the annual dues invoice later this month. Primary source of support for making all this possible is annual memberships. And I thank you if your organization is currently a member and strongly encourage you to consider joining if you're not. The annual membership fee is modest, and if your organization has a membership, then everyone in your organization is a member of ESIG. Independent consultants or individuals can also join, and ESIG provides free memberships to students of accredited educational institutions. ESIG is a great place to learn and share your expertise, and we all need to do whatever we can to bring talented people into our industry and help get them working on solving the important problems dealing with the energy transformation. Regarding logistics for today, I would ask you to note that the session will be an hour and 45 minutes to allow a little more time for presentations, and especially for Q&A and discussion at the end. We'll have four presentations of 15 or 20 minutes each in the first part of the session, followed by 20 or 25 minutes of discussion and Q&A after the last speaker. As we're doing with all of our webinars now, we'll be using the Slido platform for managing the Q&A. You should go to slido.com on your device and enter ESIG7 as the event code to ask your questions. Please be sure to indicate the person to whom you're addressing the question. The instructions are also at the bottom of the background slide for the webinar and you'll be reminded by the session chair. You'll see a thumbs up button next to the question on Slido to allow you to vote on prioritizing the question submitted. So please keep the questions coming during the presentations and we'll address them at the end. We'll follow up with written answers to any questions we don't get to during the Q&A. Recognizing the limitations of a webinar with more than 100 people on the line, the lines will be muted. So again, we ask you to use the Slido platform to ask your questions with ESIG 7 as the event code. We would also ask you if you're comfortable to identify yourself when you ask a question so we know who we're talking with. Today's session is titled Resource Adequacy and Storage for High VG Penetration. This session will cover some of the latest thinking going on inside ESIG and around the country on evolving resource adequacy methodology, including storage. The rate of change taking place in this area is nothing less than breathtaking. 
and is another example of the impact of meteorology and changing climatology, not to mention the changing generation mix on all aspects of system planning. It's important to note that the common mode failures introduced with the correlation between weather, load, and generation will also call for new planning methods in the future. Debbie Liu, who we are very fortunate to have as the Associate Director of ESIG, will chair our session today. Debbie is a familiar face to anyone who's been participating in ESIG for the past 15 or 20 years or so, and brings a lot of energy and insight to everything that she does. She's a wonderful colleague and a good friend, and I'm very happy to have her here chairing the session today. Debbie, we appreciate your participation, and I'll now turn it over to you. Oh, thank you so much, Charlie. So, welcome everyone today to the panel session on resource adequacy and storage for high variable generation uh, penetration. Um, I'm really excited today. We've got an incredible slate of speakers. So, as Charlie said, resource adequacy, it's one of the hottest topics today in our industry partly because of what happened in ERCOT in February and what happened in Cal ISO last year. We now need to deal with several factors. We know that weather is getting more extreme. We may have common mode points of failure, like what happened in Texas. And at the same time, our grid's evolving. We have more variable resources and it's more weather dependent. We also have more limited energy resources like storage, demand response, all of this means we need to simulate chronological operations because events like what happened in California, they may no longer be occurring at peak load, but now at the peak net load or perhaps whenever the storage duration ends. So you may all be aware our system planning working group has a redefining resource adequacy task force. It's working on how to evolve industry thinking. Derek Stenslick leads that task force. He recently published a report. If you haven't read it, you need to go to eSIG.Energy and download this. Uh, Derek is our first speaker today. I've been lucky to work with him through eSIG as well as previously at GE. Derek is the founding partner of Telos Energy, an analytics and engineering firm specializing in renewable energy integration and grid modeling. And with this, I'm gonna hand it over to Derek and again, ask you, the audience, to use slido.com and the code ESIG7 for any questions that you may have. Okay, take it away, Derek. Thank you, Debbie. And thank you everyone else for joining. Really looking forward to the full panel and every, what, hearing what everybody has to say on this. Uh, today, I'm gonna build on the report that Debbie just mentioned. So two months ago, we released the Redefining Resource Adequacy for Modern Power Systems report. There's links to both the white paper, the blog, the webinar, uh, on that topic where we outline six principles for uh, resource adequacy and with an evolving resource mix. Today, I'm gonna build on that and specifically get into a discussion around metrics because ultimately resource adequacy is about how we measure risk and then make planning decisions based on those measurements. And so to start, I'll, I'll briefly outline the six principles uh, that that white paper goes over. Um, I won't go into each of these. You can see them here. And again, the white paper outlines each of these in much more detail. The one I'm going to talk about the most today is the top one, although each of these will, will play a part in this presentation. But the top one is really around how we quantify, how we measure system risk, and specifically how we quantify the, the size, frequency, duration, and timing of outages to make sure that we're not only measuring system risk correctly, but we're uh, selecting the right mitigations to meet that reliability challenge. So again, uh, the, the white paper goes over each of these six. I've, I've spoken to ESIG panels in the past about those, so won't go into each of those in detail, but really wanted to focus around the metrics. And so where are we today with metrics? Uh, I have a table here on the right from the New York State Reliability Council put this together on how different system operators, different ISO RTOs, both in North America and in Europe, measure resource adequacy or measure risk. And, and just to set the stage for the rest of this panel session, when we talk about resource adequacy, it's bulk system reliability measuring whether or not we have enough resources to serve load. And so when you look at that probabilistically across all different weather conditions, different possibilities of generator failures, different load levels, you calculate essentially a probability or a likelihood that the system is unable to serve load. 
today, predominantly across North America, we're measuring that in a days per year, the one day and 10 year metric or loss of load expectation. You also hear it as 0.1 days per year. And it's simply calculating the number of times if you, you, if you simulate a system across hundreds or thousands of different permutations of weather and outages, one day in every 10 years of simulation, there is going to be not insufficient uh, resources to serve load. In, and that's the criteria that many places plan to. You can see in Western Europe, a similar criteria, loss of load hours tends to be the preference. Um, a little bit different, uh, slightly lower level of reliability in, in that context. But again, similar type of analysis and similar measure, just calculating the, the frequency that you're unable to serve load. And, and I personally have a few reservations with this approach. You know, one is that historically that one day in 10 years doesn't have a, a full grounding in you know, where that metric came from, why we selected it, what was the rationale? If you go back, this is a metric that's been around for 40, 50, 60 years. Uh, you could say it served us well in terms of we have extremely reliable grids, but the justification uh, that whether or not it's economic, it's efficient, it's the right amount of reliability. I think there's been this, what I call the line in the sand syndrome, where people plan to a one day in 10 year loss of load expectation, regardless of the cost to get there, regardless of the resources that need to be built to achieve that reliability, or regardless of the retirements that we may be able to accommodate with different levels of reliability. So it's essentially setting a line in the sand. And I think too often planners are caught in this trap where, you know, we have to design the system to re reach point one, regardless of anything else going on in the system. And I think we just need to, to think, rethink that. The other thing, uh, the other reservations I have with loss of load expectation is, you know, it's just counting the frequency of capacity shortfalls. And we're not getting much information about when the system is insufficient, what does that shortfall look like? How big is it? How large, how long does it last for? How much energy was unserved? And I think because of that, we have a, you know, a fundamental bias in our planning process. So I'm going to get into what I would call what, what I'm calling four recommendations that we can take existing resource adequacy metrics and just use them better. So nothing I'm going to talk about today is saying, this is the new metric. This is revolutionary. Nobody's done this before and we need to start using this, but rather it's, it's metrics and processes that we have in place today that we just need to use differently in the way we plan our grids, whether it's investing in new resources, making retirement decisions, or, uh, you know, evaluating the trade-off between different resource mixes. So I'll get into each of these uh, in more detail, but it's, you know, one, place more emphasis on expected unserved energy as a metric. Second is we don't have to just use one metric. We can use a suite of reliability metrics. And I think that's called for, especially in this transition of the grid. The third is around moving beyond just expected values. So we can consider not just consider these really large disruptive tail events and for the need to characterize size, frequency, duration, and timing of shortfall events. So I'll go over each of these, but again, these are the four recommendations that I've been calling for when we think about these metrics and the way we measure risk. So the first one, uh, place more emphasis on expected unserved energy. So I, I talked a little bit before about loss of load expectation, simply counting the number of events you're likely to have um, in, in your planning horizon. It doesn't tell us any information on when there's an event, how large was it, how disruptive was it, uh, was it a loss of load for 30 minutes or was it a loss of load for 10 hours? Um, so I think it's really critical to understand reliability, not just from a probability that we're going to get caught short, but also when we get caught short, how disruptive is that? That's important to understand the reliability, but it's also important to under, be, now that we have a lot of different tools in our toolkit to, to, to improve reliability. So before in the historical planning context where all we had was a gas turbine, didn't really matter you know, if it lasted for one hour or 10 hours, the gas curb, turbine can cover that. Today, we have a lot more tools available. We can have flexible load, we have demand response, energy storage, variable renewables, thermal, hydro, 
Um, and even the storage and the demand response can come in all different shapes and sizes. You can have long duration storage, very short duration uh, resources. So having a metric, you know, fast forwarding, we can now have a metric that is not just measuring the frequency of events, but also the amount of energy that we're losing. And if you just look forward in time, we are moving from a system that is capacity constrained today during peak load conditions or, or was historically, and we're rapidly transitioning to a system that is not necessarily capacity constrained, but energy constrained. Right? And you've heard a lot of folks talk about energy reserve margins or need to look at energy adequacy, not just capacity adequacy. And ultimately with that transition, I think expected unserved energy uh, or EUE, which measures the average amount of energy unserved in a year. I think that's a more valuable metric shifting to an energy limited future. So EUE, not a perfect metric. So there are both benefits and limitations. I think I touched on most of the benefits here. I tried to come up with a table to, to just characterize each of these. There are some limitations. Um, you know, ultimately we are placing a higher weight on large disruptive events. I think that's important for the planning context, but it can overlook frequent small events. And so we still have to think a little bit more about not placing all our eggs in the EUE basket. Um, there's also limited experience. There's a lot of and what I would call inertia or, or in our planning processes around one day in 10 years. It's been around for decades. People have grown accustomed to it. I think everybody kind of understands this probability uh, mindset, but moving to an EUE, we just have less uh, experience. So I think it's going to be really critical over the coming years to, to increase our understanding and, and increase the way we measure EUE across all of our system studies. And that brings me to the second point. You know, again, EUE isn't perfect there. It does miss some information. But there's no reason we need to just use one reliability metric. And so I would advocate for a suite of reliability metrics. And so on this slide, I have a table of just comparing the California event in August of 2020 to the Texas event in February of 2021. And if those events made it into your resource adequacy plan and affected these metrics, again, the, the resource adequacy metrics like LOLE, LOLH, EUE, those are average metrics across many hundreds of samples. So um, this would be, if, if they were to be included in those, in those averages, how would they measure up? And so you can see loss of load expectation or loss of load events, LOLEV, counts the number of events. Um, the California event, two events, because it occurred over two separate days. Uh, the Texas event was one event that lasted over three days. And so you can see LOL EV would actually place more uh, emphasis on the California event because it was two discrete events. When we look at loss of load expectation, which is the number of days of a shortfall, you can see California comes out slightly less impactful than the Texas event, um, but still very similar metrics. And again, these are the metrics that most of the places across North America, across the world are using to plan our systems. When you look at loss of load hours, you start to see some differentiation, you know, six hours in California versus 71 in, in Texas, but again, not dramatic. And then when you switch to expected unserved energy, you start to really understand the implications of an event as disruptive as the one we saw in Texas. So again, using different metrics, each has benefits, each has limitations. I would advocate that we need a system that looks at a suite of reliability metrics, not just one. And there's been a lot of good work on this. Uh, so I have a, a slide here that references Fazio and Hua uh, in the Northwest Power Pool or Northwest uh, Council. And it looks at, they, they did some analysis that shows the relationship between and EUE, which is normalized EUE as a percentage of load versus loss of load events, the number of events. And you can see on the chart on the left, a very linear relationship. And what the way they uh, characterize this is if you're in a scenario family, which is very similar resources, very similar load, there is a very linear relationship between LOE and EUE. But when you start to completely shift the resource mix. If you have a totally different resource mix, a totally different scenario family, you are have that linear relationship within a scenario family, but you can't necessarily 
compare across scenarios. And so that linear relationship between EUE and LOLE starts to break down. And I think in that paper, they do a great job talking about uh, using LOLE, LOLH, and EUE to measure uh, the frequency, duration, and magnitude of the events themselves and understand that the use of three metrics can be used and ultimately you can set reliability criteria across all three. So I think there's a lot of good work being done, especially, you know, no surprise that it's coming out of the Northwest because the Northwest is more energy constrained historically than the rest of the country because of their reliance on hydro resources. So they're, you know, obviously more emphasis historically on EUE and energy metrics. Uh, but again, I think fast forwarding across the rest of the country, as we switch towards variable renewables and storage and demand response for the, the backbone of our reliability, we are fast forwarding to an energy a potential energy limited grid. And so having an energy uh, metric is useful there. Uh, so the third recommendation is we don't have to just look at the average event. And so all of the metrics I've talked about today are expected values or they're, they're summarizing the average. If we looked across 500 years of simulation, it's, it's simply stating across all 500, what's the average number of events of a shortfall per year, what's the average expected on certain energy? Very useful for comparing one you know, scenario or one resource mix to another, but doesn't give the full insight into the reliability risk because you could have scenarios or resource mixes with very similar expected values. The average is about the same, but very different tail events. And so I think as we think about a system with you know, introducing more climate change risk, more potential for these large disruptive weather events, it's gonna be more important, it's gonna be increasingly important to look at these tail events. When I get caught short, how bad could it get? And I think there it's a valuable, it, it's kind of on the edge of reliability versus resiliency. And what's the difference between those two? I think when we get into resiliency, it's when we have these really large disruptive events, how bad are they? How long does it take to get back? I think going beyond just expected values is, is important for that. Uh, and there, there are places doing that today. I, the one that I know of, there might be others, but is in Belgium where they have a dual reliability criterion. Uh, they have the average loss of load hours. So they say, we're gonna design the system for an LOLH of less than or equal to three hours per year. But we also have another caveat that says the extreme tail event uh, the 95th percentile of all the events that we saw has to be less than 20 hours. And that way you're capturing on average, we want to make sure the system is designed in a way that uh, we're, we're no more likely than three hours per year to have a shortfall. On the other hand, also making sure we're capping our tail on risk, like how bad could things get? And lastly, the fourth recommendation, this is laid out uh, extensively in the, in the report, but going beyond just summarizing the number of events that we had or the probability of some of these shortfalls, but really characterizing the shortfalls themselves. So when we have a shortfall, how large was it? How long did it last for? And you can see from this chart, um, the, the examples on the left are two examples that have the same loss of load events, they're both one event that lasted four hours, but you can see very different in terms of their, the amount of energy in that event, the maximum amount of load that was shed and, and the, the maximum uh, megawatt hours. Conversely, on the right-hand side, again, events that show up with the same amount of energy being shed, but very different in the amount of maximum uh, power that was, was unserved and the number of events. And so really starting to understand Again, not just the probability of these events occurring, but when there is an event, what does it look like? And I think this is critical for understanding what resource is best suited to meet that need. Because if you look at it and all of our events are one or two hours, start to really think that, well, maybe demand response is a really crucial asset for that. But if we look at the events and they tend to be eight hours, you need a long duration resource, whether it's long duration storage or thermal or some other op option. And I know I'm running up on time here, so I did include in the deck a few further examples of how you could characterize that. 
Uh, this is a chart where you have energy uh, uh, again, when there's an event, what uh, energy unserved on the rows going down and the maximum size of the event in going across columns in this context, in this, this system, you know, 70% were covered by a resource of 70 megawatts or 60 megawatts for two hours. 85% were covered by a hundred megawatt resource available for two hours. And I think when we start to look at our shortfalls in this way, it becomes abundantly clear that having a re, you know uh, a new thermal resource built just to be around once every five years to cover a two-hour shortfall starts to become you know pretty clear that that might not be needed now it might change over time and so it's really important to keep track of of metrics like this and so i do want to make time for other other speakers i just have other ways of visualizing well, apparently that one didn't come through but other ways of visualizing this risk you know, here this slide shows the timing of risk, both seasonally and by hour of day, which again, this is changing dramatically as the resource mix changes. So important that we go beyond just our average resource adequacy metrics and start to really dig into when are these events occurring? Why are they occurring? And what can I do about it? And what mitigation is available for me? And with that, I will close out and uh, hand it over to Debbie, who can who can kick off the other panel. But if you have any questions or comments, I'd like to hear from it in the chat as well as uh, afterwards. Thank you so much, Derek. That was a great presentation. I especially like the new graphics and the new ways of trying to visually show um, what's important here. Uh, so, um, again, please enter questions into slido.com and um, I'd like to make sure everyone gets their time. So I'm only going to take clarification questions and I, I think um, at the moment, uh, uh, the questions are a little bit more to stimulate discussion. So we're going to put those off until everyone has spoken. So I, I'm next going to introduce Greg Carrington. He's going to talk about the Western Resource Adequacy program. This is one of the most exciting developments for cooperation between the many BAs in the Western interconnection. Um, we all know, you know, we can save money if we can share and plan for bigger versus smaller systems. And um, you're probably well aware you know, when SPP expanded its footprint and its size five years ago, they were able to drop their planning reserve margin and save $90 million a year. So hopefully, um, the West can now build on those kinds of successes. So Greg Carrington, he's got more than 37 years of experience in the utility industry. He's the chief operating officer for the Northwest Power Pool, and he is leading this regional resource adequacy program. Greg, take it away. Thank you. Uh, well, thanks for inviting me. And uh, before we get going on describing the program, I want to tell you a little bit about the Northwest Power Pool. So we're a uh, a nonprofit organization. We were formed in 1917, but we actually got employees in 1941 during the uh, war time. Uh, and really, what our goal is at, for the Northwest Power Pool is to help utilities collaborate and coordinate and do programs and projects that they can't do by themselves. So, examples of that is that we have a contingency reserve sharing group and, and we um, basically span all the way from Canada to the desert southwest. We have most of the utilities in the western region uh, as members of the Northwest Power Pool. Uh, we also have a frequency response and sharing group and we also have a um, transmission planning group where we're sharing uh, planning resources from a transmission perspective as well. So this program, which is the Western Resource Adequacy Program, is an example of another sharing program. And I consider this to be a capacity sharing program. It's a little bit different than the others because the others mostly operate in real time, whereas the capacity sharing program has a real time component, but it also has the planning horizon of seven months out. And I'll describe that in more detail as well. So this is a, a pivotal time for our program because it wasn't until last Thursday that all of our member companies that are participating in the program um, agreed to move forward with the implementation. So essentially what we've done, and I'll, I'll get into this in more detail, 
detail is we have this comprehensive design document that's on our website, northwestpowerpool.org. And we're taking this theoretical and we're putting it into practice. And I'll describe to you today how we're gonna go about doing that. And, uh, you know, I was thinking about Derek's presentation and we are going to be using similar metrics to what he was talking about, the loss of load expectations. But this program is what do we do when the resources exceed those limits uh, as indicated by those metrics. So you can think of this program as when you are doing your normal planning and you come to the table with the resources needed to meet your P50 plus a planning reserve margin, how are you gonna get help? And this entire program is set up to go beyond the metrics to provide support. It's about neighbors helping neighbors and how are we gonna make that happen? And that's the way that you should think about it. So I'm gonna move on to the next slide. Um, I mentioned to you that on our website, we have the detailed design document and uh, there's three main components of it and it's the governance, the forward showing design and the operational design. We had to set up governance because most uh, resource adequacy programs are located in RTOs or ISOs in the US anyways. And uh, we don't have that on the West. Uh, we mostly operate through bilateral transactions. And uh, so we had to stand up an independent board uh, and we are anticipating that it'll be FERC jurisdictional as well because there are penalties uh, that I'll describe a little bit later. And then we have the forward showing program, which is essentially proving that people have the resources uh, and they come to the table and prepare to help their neighbors. And then the operational design. And the thing that's really significant about the operational design is that we hired the Southwest Power Pool to basically be our operator in the West, to pay attention to what's happening, to pay attention to when utilities net load is going to be deficit and when are they going to need help and when are they going to put out notices. So we're, we had to set up the governance and we had to hire a program operator that has visibility across the grid in totality because we have the two Canadian provinces and 11 states and we had to allow for that visibility including not only generating generation resources but also transmission and deliverability requirements as well. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this document. You notice at the bottom right on the bottom here is where you can uh, acquire a copy of that detailed design document nwpp.org. Okay, so the area that we're talking about is shown on the map here. So you can see the two Canadian provinces and uh, all the way down to the desert southwest. Uh, we're anticipating that the desert southwest will participate at some point in the near future. Uh, but the ones that are shown in color are the ones that have signed up for the program. The ones that are shown with hash marks are Northwest Power Pool members that have not yet joined the program. Uh, you know, they do get some of their resources to the east. And so they're evaluating their options of getting some of the resources from the east and so forth. And we're concentrating on the area that's shown on the page here. Uh, in totality, the Northwest Power Pool footprint uh, serves a peak load of about 86,000 megawatts of capacity. Uh, by comparison, the Southwest Power Pool peak load is about 50 and the California peak load is about 50. So we're about 50% greater than that. So far we have 22 BAs and utilities that have signed up for the resource adequacy program. And that equates to about 60,000 megawatts of the 86,000 uh, that are participating in this sharing program. So project timeline, we started about two years ago, uh, back in 2019. Uh, and what we did is we went out there and did an inventory of how all of the utilities are measuring resource adequacy. Uh, we came to the conclusion fairly quickly that all of the uh, utilities and the BAs in the Western Interconnect are doing it differently. So uh, we had a chore um, ahead of us to set up a, a uniform metric that people could measure themselves by. 
Uh, the other thing we did is we looked at all of the RA programs in the US, in uh, Europe, and in Australia, and took a look at what we considered to be the best of the best. Uh, we also had to take into account the fact that we're a bilateral market and we took a, we had to make sure that any program we did for the West would fit into a bilateral market as well. Uh, in um, June of 2020, we completed the conceptual design. And then over the last year between June and of 2020 and June of this year, we completed the detailed design document. As I mentioned to you, that's 200 and more than 250 pages. I'm going to do my best to describe what's included in that uh, during this presentation in 20 minutes. Uh, so we're beginning implementation. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out on here is FERC approval on the bottom right hand corner. You can see the green arrow. Uh, we will submit a filing with FERC sometime around March of next year. And we have given ourselves about a year to get FERC approval. And then the other thing in the upper left corner, it's called stage zero. While we're setting this program up, we've set up a informal sharing program and we will be um, already practicing sharing capacity on the Western Interconnect. Uh, this year alone, when we had a heat wave come through the north or northwest portion of our footprint, uh, there was sharing events that occurred both in June and July. Got you know up to I think 118 degrees Fahrenheit in Portland, Oregon, which is unprecedented and also consistent with what Derek was talking about. What we're seeing is um, higher peaks uh, that are occurring, uh, and we are seeing the duration being different. And we're seeing those events occurring at different times of the year. And I'll describe to you on the next slides uh, basically what sort of window we're looking at for this event, for um, this program, I mean. So if we do it right, uh, we should increase the reliability because don't forget, we're now all geared up to adhere to a common metric. But on top of that, when one entity's um, low peak net load exceeds what they are coming to the table with, which is the uh, having enough capacity to serve their peak load plus a planning reserve margin, we now have this network of utilities that are, are poised to help out anybody that exceeds their peak load. And if we do it right, uh, because of the diversity in our footprint, and I think uh, Debbie indicated to you that there was a big savings in the Southwest Power Pool. Uh, the same thing goes here. You can see from the map that I showed earlier, huge geographical uh, diversity. Uh, the peaks that occur in the winter in the north are different than the peaks that occur in the south that are mostly summer peaks. Uh, when one area is peaking, the other area is not, and we're setting up a, a system and a program so that we can share in that diversity. And then on top of that, we have generation diversity as well. You know, if I was a service provider and I had a wind project in my footprint, uh, how much of the wind supply would you count on being there during your capacity critical hours? Uh, if it was just my own wind farm, I would say zero because I, I couldn't guarantee that the wind would be blowing at exactly the time that I needed. But I can say because of the geographical diversity of our footprint, that just because wind's not blowing in my service territory, I know somewhere in that footprint, uh, the wind will be blowing and I can count on that capacity from other areas to help me out in a time of need. And then I already talked about the last one, which is the improved visibility and coordination uh, by hiring the program operator to have visibility and I call it situational awareness. Uh, I'll describe to you exactly how we're going to be monitoring the grid as a whole and how that improved visibility we think is going to improve reliability. So um, here's essentially a snapshot of the program as a whole. So uh, the forward showing uh, program, which is expected to occur seven months prior to each peak season because of our footprint, we have a winter peak and we have a summer peak. Uh, each entity participating is going to submit a workbook to the program operator, proving that they have enough resources to serve their P50 load plus their planning reserve margin. Uh, the program operator will review that if for some reason the capacity that they're counting 
doesn't count or there's a problem with it, uh, the program operator will get back to the entity filing and they will be able to go and cure that deficiency over a two month period. Uh, one thing that I wanted to point on the left hand side is that we're going to have the program operator running the studies and the studies are going to be done five years and two years out so that if, if it turns out that the program operator identifies a potential shortfall in our region or in a sub-region of our footprint, then people will be notified about that five to two years in advance. So if somebody has to go out there and build the resources, they have the time to do that. If they have to go and execute a contract, then they have time to do that as well. And then as we move into the operational program, which is shown here in orange, uh, six days prior to a potential event, the program operator will be doing uh, running tallies of how the system is stacking up. If it turns out that uh, the, the whole um, system is long and there doesn't look like there's going to be events, then the program operator will begin to release the capacity for people to trade in the normal way they do in pre-schedule or in real time. If it turns out that the program operator is unsure about whether or not an event is going to be occurring, they will put everybody on notice that it looks as though we could be having a, um, an event within our footprint and they will then send out a notification about the um, basically the megawatts or the energy that's going to be needed in the upcoming days and people will be uh, expected to come to the table with their sharing requirements, uh, probably not their full amounts, but there will be some portion of that that will be distributed. And then we will be taking a look at that on both the pre-schedule basis and then during real, real time. If during pre-schedule it, it still looks like there's going to be an event, uh, everybody will have a holdback requirement or a sharing requirement that they will need to be bring forward into the uh, real time, into the operating day. Um, uh, people will get paid for holding back energy and they will get paid uh, if energy is actually deployed during real time as well. So I'm gonna move on to the next slide. So um, real quickly, I wanted to highlight for you the governance. Uh, we have to have an independent board of directors that's gonna be FERC qualified. We uh, are setting up a governance committee that is very strong member driven, utility driven uh, committees that will be uh, essentially looking at changes to the program. We know, I can tell you right now that this program is not perfect. Uh, you know, we just have um, ideas down on paper, we're putting into practice. There will be changes. The, the whole program is set up to be very dynamic and very fluid, learn as we go and make changes. Um, and I think Derek was alluding to the fact that maybe the metric that everybody's coming to the table with is, is not adequate and we need to change that metric. This, the participant com committee is where those changes would occur. Other um, things that we've set up is there's a committee of state regulators. Um, and uh, so we have 11 states uh, that are gonna be participating on this committee and two Canadian provinces. And we're in the process of essentially getting their feedback about the governance and how they want to set up their committee to review changes to this and to approve things that are being done. Uh, because it's an independent board, we're going to have a nominating committee that will um, basically hire the independent board of directors. One thing that is important here is the multi-sector representatives. So we will have utilities that will be on the nominating committee. We'll have non-government organizations and we will have other people who are affected by resource adequacy on the nominating committee to make sure that the board is seen as being independent and fair and, uh, and the things that they do are just and reasonable. At the same time, we're gonna set up a program review committee that's gonna be multi-sector based. So as changes occur, we wanna make sure we get input from all stakeholders that are affected. And then finally, the last thing that we have in our governance is the independent evaluator. And the independent evaluator will be reporting to the board of directors. Um, right now, we're anticipating that they will be doing an annual review of the program, making recommendations. And uh, uh, really what we wanna do is how do we become more effective? Are we doing the right things? And how do we become more efficient, efficient in what we do? And that is doing, you know, uh, we're doing the right things, but are we doing it in the right way? So that's really what the goal of the independent evaluator is. 
times as well. So, for um, Greg, I just wanted to mention, Greg, we've got three and a half minutes left. So. Okay, that's great. I'll, I'll uh, go through these pretty quickly. So, in, in the uh, document itself, you will see a forward uh, showing design. And this is an outline of what's in the document itself. So, you can see uh, the, sh you know, the compliance timing, the RA program metrics, the load forecasting, resource eligibility, how do we count uh, qualifying capacity, and uh, what does the forward showing portfolio need to look like? And all of the details are in the detailed design document as well. And I'm going to skip down to the uh, operational uh, outline and just describe to you real quickly. The same thing goes in the operational design. So in the uh, detailed design document, you will see uh, all of the things that we are thinking about on the operational design. It'll talk about what the holdback requirements are, what the sharing requirements are, how capacity will be released so that people can go and trade that, and how energy will be deployed. One very important aspect about all of this is the transmission service and of having uh, deliverability as part of the sharing requirement as well. We are anticipating in the forward showing program that people have to come to the table with 75% of their capacity um, being served with firm or conditional firm transmission. And in the operational time period, if there's a sharing event, uh, everybody is expected to come to the table with firm, conditional firm for their sharing amount or the amount necessary to serve their load in the event that they are the ones that are expected to be short. So um, I will just skip down uh, this. I just wanted to highlight this one slide a little bit for you. And I mentioned, I described this to you um, verbally before, and you can see here that in the pre-scheduled day, six days out is when the program operator is doing that running assessment as to whether there will be an uh, event occurring at some point. Then three days out, they will be releasing capacity requirements if it is not required. At 5 a.m. on the pre-scheduled day, they will be letting people know whether or not they need to hold anything back prior to them, anybody booking that out. And then we get, um, if there is an event that is scheduled to occur, then at T minus 90 for every hour of that operating day, we will be doing rolling calculations and uh, be letting people know whether there's a sharing event or not. So um, that is, uh, I just wanted to uh, summarize this and say uh, that we're moving into the implementation. We have begun that we had uh, just before this meeting, we had our first uh, RA participant committee meeting. Uh, and we are having our first planning meeting with the Southwest Power Pool next week. Uh, we are expecting that we will have three seasons of the non-binding forward showing program to test it out, to do the beta testing, and that we're expecting that to be the winter of 22, the summer of 23, and the winter of 23. And then we are preparing for later phases. We expect that we will make a decision about moving into a binding uh, program in December of 22. And Debbie, I'm going to turn it back over to you and uh, we'll go from there. Thanks. Okay. Thank you so much, Greg, and um, for the presentation and also for your work over the last uh, few years in developing that and pulling people together and making this reality. As I mentioned, I, I think this is one of the most important um, activities going on in the West right now to try and save money for all customers as well as manage um, um, what's happening, um, both to weather and on our changing system. Uh, now we're going to take a deeper dive into how a balancing authority considers variable resources and limited energy resources in its resource planning. So there are locational diversity considerations. There's effects from penetration levels. There's interactions between resources. Keith Parks is considering all of this kind of stuff and his modeling for Public Service Colorado. Uh, Keith Parks is a, a senior market operations analyst at Excel. He's been at the forefront of renewables integration for 20 years. I'm really lucky to have gotten to work with him uh, when we were both at NREL and, and now um, with ESIG and, and Excel being a valuable member. 
Keith gave a version of this presentation at our training for NARUC and ASIO NASUCA this summer. And um, I'm going to turn it over now to Keith. Hi, everyone. Um, Debbie, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you fine. Great. Thank you, Debbie. Um, so I'm going to start with my, um, I'm going to be queuing slides as I go through. So I'll just say next slide when I'm ready to do that. So on the title slide here, I have capacity credit for energy limited resources. And we're really talking about um, the ELCC, and that's the um, equivalent load carrying capacity in the Piesco, Piesco Public Service of Colorado, um, a BA or utility within, uh, within the state of Colorado. It's the largest utility in Colorado. And the ERP, the Energy Resource Plan. So it is, uh, the resource plan is, is how we acquire new resources, either self-builds or, or contracted resources. So uh, we'll go next slide. What, what we are discussing. And specifically, we're discussing this report, this this really long title, which essentially boils down to what we now affectionately call the ELCC study. And while there's no author on the paper itself, I want to give credit to Kent Scholl, who who did most of this analysis, that pretty, all of the analysis, and the and, and the bulk of the writing. Um, a really a great comprehensive piece of work. I'm still learning things. Uh, from this report, and I'm only going to give you just sort of a, a taste of what's of what's in here. If you find this interesting, please find this report and and really dig into it. There's some fascinating um, graphics. Um, next slide. So I want to start with a primer, and I want to talk about this concept of firm capacity. So there's there's what's on the left hand column. We have the installed capacity. That's the total amount of steel in the ground, wind, solar, fossil-based resources, hydro, et cetera, right? There's planning to be, by 2030, 17 gigawatts of resources installed to serve public service of Colorado customers, right? But, but all of the, some of those resources are intermittent. Some of those resources are energy limited. Um, they don't, and, 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 and those 17,000 megawatts of resource is to serve a system that's expected to peak at around 8,000, really more like 7,500 megawatts. So there's a big gap. There's a lot more installed capacity than actual load. And the reason for that is because those resources are not necessarily available during um, times of system stress. So we have this concept of firm capacity. How much of that can you how much of each of those resources can you rely upon um, to serve that peak low, that, that, that sort of stress situation, you know, the time when those resources are uh, maybe not as available as you'd want them to be, and you have a lot of load. And the, and the translation between those two is this thing called capacity credit. So you take the installed capacity times the capacity credit to come up with the firm capacity. So you can see of those 17 gigawatts, they all translate, they all have different percentages, translates to 8.7 gigawatts. And just to let you know, in this, in this situation, our system is considered reliable when we have 8.5 gigawatts or more of resource. So this system would be considered reliable under the metrics that we've adopted, the 0.1 per year or the one event in 10 year standard. We'll go next slide. So this capacity credit is ultimately what I calculate or what Kent calculated in this report. Um, and it, that's the amount of installed capacity counting as firm as we talk. And, and just to show you what some of the, you know, and, and, but this capacity credit can be, can be derived many times. It could be a rule of thumb, it could be regulatory designation. There, there's, there's an approximate generation method. There's various methods to do that. What we did in Piesco is we used the effective or equivalent load carrying capability um, and, and we consider, and I think a lot of people here would consider the gold standard, which is a mathematical method for determine a reliability-based capacity credit. And granted, we are using this 0.1 per year um, metric for this calculation. Next slide. Um, so what's the data set? We, 
we looked in the future, not terribly far in the future, but in 2023, we looked at the total amount of thermal generation capacity, scheduled outages, historic E4s, forced outages, and then we use we combine that with hourly load and renewable generation from six annual periods, 2014 to 2019, carefully grown to these new levels of of wind and solar, you know, considering, and and we had hourly DR and storage dispatched to maximize the LOLP. So we didn't necessarily it wasn't being dispatched for economics; it was being dispatched for reliability. And that's sort of a you know, um, it was simply trying to capture and allocate capacity to the hours of highest probable loss of load. And 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 keep in mind the calculations that what I'm going to show you is for incremental resources on a system that's already flush and going to be even more flush with wind, solar, and dispatchable energy limited resources like DR and energy storage. So we're going to do a little game. I'm going to show a slide, and there's not going to be any text on it. There's going to be some graphics, and then I want you to sort of, and I'll give you like 15 to 30 seconds to just look at that and just try to identify the most interesting aspects of that graph. And then I'll show you what I think are the most interesting aspects of that graph. And some things that I want you to look for is how like affects like. That is, it changes with in increasing penetration of the same resource and that diversity matters. And that is that, you know, renewable energy particularly sited at the same location drives down ELCC than a geographically diverse portfolio. So those are the little tips you know, as we go to the next slide. So we'll move to the next slide called incremental wind. And, and as you're looking at this slide, I'll just describe some of the things. On the left, there's a map that's the state of Colorado. It's that rectangle in the middle of the country. And then I have those ovals. Those ovals represent existing wind farms. And those, those, that's E or Z, one, two, three, those are energy resource zones. Those are sort of, you know, these, these geographic designations that we have for saying where those where those which which areas those resources exist and up on the on the there's a little graph tucked up on the upper right of the of the larger graph those show you the that those bars tell you the amount of wind that exists already exists in these various areas right and so then we have what we have is the amount of wind as you go off to the x axis that means more and more wind is being installed at each of these zones and as I've talked, I hope that you've been sort of consuming this and trying to pick out the most interesting aspects of it. And with that, we'll go to the next slide. So the, the first thing that really jumps out at me is ERZ3 is dramatically higher than ERZ1 and 2. And there's a couple reasons for this. It's, it's diverse. It, it, is, there's, there's, it is a resource area that is relatively untapped because there's not a lot of, there's very little transmission down there uh, leading to the west. Um, it's unique, you know, that it, its wind profile is different than what the other two zones are, and there's not a lot of wind already there. There's very little wind. You can see that's the smallest of the three bars. And so it hasn't already had sort of its capacity credit sort of declining, you know, as you've added more and more resources, you know. Clearly, as you add more wind, there is a declining ELCC. And we're talking just wind, right? And marginally, which is the dashed lines, you can see, you know, once you've added a gigawatt or two gigawatts of wind in that ERZ3 quadrant, it now, now its ELCC is, is sort of similar to the others. So you can sort of exhaust the capacity to credit by sort of throwing a bunch of wind in that one area if you chose, so choose to. But clearly there's, there's opportunity there. It's a resource that would provide a lot of capacity relative to its peers, given that in its peers, I mean the peers being its geographic areas, you know, already, already have a lot of wind in them, right? Anyway, I'm sure there's lots of other things that are really interesting about this graph. There's a lot of things very interesting. There's a lot of graphs like this in Kent's paper, and you can spend a lot of time looking at it. So we're gonna move on to the next slide, and it's called incremental solar. And again, I'll just talk you through what you're seeing, and then you can kind of make up your own mind as to what's interesting about it. We have the state of Colorado. I have labeled the various regions that we break up in terms of you know, NFR, that's Northern Front Range, Southern Front Range, Western Slope. There's some, you know, right in the middle, there's BTM that's behind the meter, that's 
concentrated in the Denver area, the Denver metro area. Um, and those map to these various paths that you're seeing. And then again, in that upper right hand corner, the existing capacity in most of those, and the one that has the most, and I'm kind of giving it away, Southern Front Range has the most solar in it today, followed by behind the meter. So just take a look at those graphs and and just pick out a few things that I think are interesting. And we'll just move to the next slide now. So this is this is a busy, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot going on here. First of all, this diversity effect. I want to I just notice that this sort of like large, relatively large spread of incremental capacity, of incremental ELCCs, i.e. capacity credits, I, I use those interchangeably, um, where areas like the Western Slope and the Northern Front Range are diverse, they're unique, they're high, they have very little existing solar resource installed in them today, right? So where you have less resource, if the resource is good and you don't have a lot of solar there already, you get this, you get this benefit. Where is it the least? It's the least in the southern front range. That's where, that's where we have a lot of transmission capability. It's where it's a great solar resource. That's where the solar resource has been installed to date. And then the second is behind the meter, partly because there's a lot of behind the meter solar already, but also that there's a technology disadvantage there. Every other one of these trends is imagining a community scale or utility scale project where there's single access tracking. On the behind the meter, those are specifically, that's rooftop applications, it's fixed pane. And the fixed pane resource has, gets a lower capacity credit than your single access tracking. So that particular stream, that particular series of numbers is lower, not only because there's, there's already existing resources in it, but because there's a technology disadvantage, i.e. fixed pain, right? There is this one dark line, the black line with the, with the, with the diamonds on it that goes through the, what that imagines is that imagines sort of an, a parity installation of solar across the entire state. And you'll notice that by the time you get to the end, by the time you get to, what is that, uh, three gigawatts, and we're imagining installing something like three gigawatts between now and 2030, is that geographic diversity wins in terms of capacity. So that if you can have the foresight to spread all these resources around, you will end up having a higher aggregate capacity credit than if you concentrated at any one particular spot. Now, granted, that doesn't take into account things like, you know, transmission or land use or things like that, but one could imagine this, you know, geographically diverse solar resource and that that actually has a capacity credit, a capacity value to in it of itself, of itself. Um, and of course, with more solar, there's a declining ELCC in general. Let's go to the next slide. The next slide, there's really not a lot of pictures. You, you generally have the right aid. You, you generally be able to follow along, but I have different hours of storage. The top one is eight hours of storage. The middle one's four hours of storage and the bottom one's two hours of storage. Okay. Again, installed capacity going off to the right. And then it's, and then it's capacity credit in terms of this percentage there on the Y axis. And those are average and marginal. The average is the solid and the marginal is the dashed line. This is a really interesting one. Let's go to the next slide. We'll, we'll, we'll give you a little text here. So the first one I wanna focus on is more hours higher ELCC. That makes sense. If you've got a two hour resource, if you have a four hour resource, that's gonna have greater capacity credit than two hour, eight hour greater than four. As you add more storage, you have a declining ELCC. So as you, as you add a lot of two hour storages, it's going to sort of erode away as itself. And actually there's an interrelationship to this. It's like you don't get to add two hour and then start on the four hour. It eats away at one another. Now that's really hard to put on a graph, but you can imagine that 
storage sort of storage declines in general, not just on a particular number of hours. A piece here, the sort of the secret here is that there's that this this one is there's already eleven hundred megawatts of generally four hour storage or like resource, right? There's a large pump storage facility. There's an expectation of 300 megawatts of batteries coming online between now and 2030. And, and there's um, a tremendous amount of demand response, all of which is executed on a four hour time frame, right? All of that adds up to 1100 megawatts or about 15% of our total capacity need, right? So at 15%, you know, we already have a lot of four-hour type resources. You start seeing this tailing off of capacity value at all levels. Clearly, the two- and four-hour start low, and they get lower. The eight-hour looks like it starts high, but look at that marginal trajectory. It declines quite steeply, quick, you know, within, gosh, you know, within 1,000 megawatts, right? And that they all these, all of these resources sort of live down at the bottom here. And what this shows is that storage plays a part. It just can't, you can't. The whole system, you have to have higher and higher, more and more hours of storage to be able to maintain high accreditation for each incremental resource. And I'm going to, and then we're going to do one more of these and then I'll be done. And so the, the next one is storage and solar, right? So now we're going to look at the interplay of these two resources where each line is a constant amount of storage. And then we're going to add, we're just going to add more and more and more solar. And we're going to see what happens to that storage facility. How is it, how is it impacted by more and more solar, right? And, I'm, and we do this at 250, 500, 1,000, and 2,000 megawatts of storage. So at each one of those trajectories, the storage stays the same. All that changes is the solar. And let's go to the final slide. So maybe this seems – so first of all, it shows that as you add a lot more and more storage, the, the, the capacity credit generally goes down. We already talked about that. But I think what might be non-intuitive here is that initially you add more solar, you have a declining ELCC, ever so slight, right? And then there's a point, you know, when you hit about 1,000 megawatts of incremental solar, that it starts tipping back up again. And so, and so you add a lot more solar – and the ELCC goes up. But it only sort of climbs back to where it was initially because you declined in the first place, right? And I think we generally think of storage and solar as having this great interplay that you add solar, you're, gonna, you're just gonna increase the value of the storage. Well, not initially, because solar is already getting a lot of the capacity credit that storage would get if solar wasn't there, meaning that there's some competition between the four hours that the, that the storage wants and the four hours that the solar is going to bite off because the solar initially provides a high capacity credit. It's only when the solar capacity credit is really in decline that storage really provides that boost. And that's what you see on the tail end of these graphs that you see the, this, the, the capacity credit actually increasing for those resources. Little secret here, this is for a diversified solar portfolio. So we were looking at that one portfolio that uh, previously that, that got the highest at the end. Well, this is using that trajectory. You know, if you focused it all in one area, storage would get a much higher capacity credit because it would be, you know, because the solar would be just, you know, it would all be coming in the middle of the day with no place to go. And that's all I got, Debbie. I'll, I'll, um, I'll hand back some of my time. Oh, Thanks. That was a great presentation, Keith, and um, uh, that, that was a lot of fun. I think you've, you've got a, a new career in being a professor in the future. Um, <laughs> and, and there is uh, <laughs> there is a little bit more time, So, um, and there is a clarifying question from Mark Alstrom, and that's about the fact that uh. you used 100% for the ELCC of um, thermal resources. So I think you're going to need to mm -hmm. explain how you can use 100% for ELCC of a thermal resource when it's got a forced outage rate? Well, uh, inherent in the analysis, and we use the capacity outage probability table for this, inherent in this analysis is the derating of, of those various resources 
that, you know, as they get derated, it would provide opportunity, you know, for other resources to have to, to be able to make up that difference. So we're using 100% as just a metric. It's just a starting point to say this resource, this resource, a, a resource that, um, you know, like a new natural gas combustion turbine gets 100%. But through its analysis would, would actually provide, you know, it would get derated throughout the analysis. It would, and derated meaning it gets, you know, sort of, you know, the, the combined probability of, you know, many units being offline. That simply provides an opportunity for these other resources, storage, wind and solar, right? You know, if there's a, if you had all these resources had a 50% force outage rate, which would be terrible, then you would see these, um, you would see the need for um, <coughs> a lot more capacity in general. You'd either need of, and of these various sorts, whether that be wind, solar, storage, or, you know, um, you know, traditional fossil-based resources. So I'd say that the force outage rate is sort of embedded in the analysis itself. And that's how we, um, and and that's how we consider, um, that's how we we use that 100 percent as just a marker. It's a starting point um, for all other resources uh, to be measured against, which will be ultimately less than those um, you know traditional uh, resources that we count on. You know, 8760. Right. Okay. Thanks, Keith. Um, I'd next like to turn it over to John Simonelli. Um, John Simonelli is going to be talking about hydropower and its role in supporting high penetrations of variable generation. Um, John is an old friend of mine. He's retired now from the ISO New England after 40 years. He's currently the managing director of Flashover, um, which is a consulting firm specializing in power system planning and operations. And I've been really lucky um, in the last year to work with John because he's been supporting several ESIC efforts, including the National Transmission Planning Towards 100% Clean Energy White Paper. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, John. Okay. Uh, everyone hear me? Yes. Good. Okay. Well, thank you for the intro, uh, Debbie, and, and greetings to all the folks in all the different time zones that are sitting in on the call. Um, I'll apologize in advance. Sometimes I, I slip back into my Italian heritage and I talk with my hands and I want to walk around the podium so I may disappear from the screen. So uh, Debbie's my policeman and, and will reel me back in when I get out of control. Uh, this presentation is based on a white paper that Nick Miller and I did. And it kind of is a crystal ball uh, white paper. It looks out into the future, tries to predict what the system might look like in the Northeast and also the role of hydro in that system. Uh, the real crux of the problem is the second bullet. There are tens of gigawatts of variable resources proposed along the Eastern seaboard. Um, you know, at any given time, and the numbers are fluid, but you know, 50, 60,000 megawatts of offshore wind, uh, another 20, 30,000 megawatts of onshore wind and solar, and so, um, DOE, the Water Power Technologies Office of DOE and NREL came to Nick and I and, and asked if we could kind of put our combined experience together and, and kind of draw a picture of what the future system might look like and, and where hydro fits. So I apologize for the two ugly mug shots on, on this slide, but a uh, little background about both, both Nick and I. Um, Nick, for those that don't know, is probably, I consider him one of the international experts and, uh, on inverter technology, and uh, he uh, opted to hand off the presentation to me. Uh, so, with that little bit, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the New England system for people that aren't familiar with it. Talk about the New England duck curve. Yes, folks, it's not exclusive to California ISO. A little bit about the future, what it holds for renewables and loads and ties in the area, the challenges that that creates and uh, where can hydro make some inroads? And specifically, when we talk hydro, we're probably really focusing on pump storage because traditional hydro on, on the rivers is, is, eh, is gonna be a difficult uh, road to hoe. And then how do we move things forward? Uh, the New England region, six states, populations there, the number of generators, miles of transmission, um, the region's added about $12 billion of transmission in the last 10 years. And, and so they found the secret key to unlock building transmission. 
um, about 31,500 megawatts of resources and another 767 of DR has cleared in the capacity market for the year. Um, all time peak 28,000, uh, not a huge ISO RTO relative to a lot of our neighbors, but uh, big enough. Have not hit a new peak since 06. Um, really odd for us folks that were around in the eight and 9% low growth years. Combination extreme weather event that summer with a heat wave followed up by a collapse of the US economy in 08. And by the time the economy caught up and load started coming back, it was all but offset by the growth in behind the meter resources. So 15 years, no new peak. About 3 billion in the energy capacity market, maybe another 2.7 in the capacity market. Those are down significantly. You know, if we go back five, eight years ago, double and triple the amount of money flowing in the markets. Uh, the region itself, ISO New England is the independent system operator for the region under the watchful eye of our friends in DC at FERC. Um, when you look at the NERC reliability standards, uh, ISO New England is registered as almost the complete alphabet soup from the operational side to the planning side, including resource planning, uh, independent of all market functions other than administering and running those markets. And I think you'll see later on in this presentation, the last bullet kind of plays into some of the issues. And that is that because of running the capacity market and the energy markets, the ISO is required to remain neutral to resource fuel type. So the duck curve, uh, Nick and I selected May 2nd, 2020, when we started on the white paper as a representative duck curve for New England. When you look at this particular graph, you know, the, the load is in blue and you see the offset for the behind the meter and the load represented in the orange curve. And green kind of highlights the pricing issues, you know, the depressed price, pricing in the middle of the day. And then those spikes when that evening ramp comes comes roaring in. Um, you know, folks have been looking at this kind of a, of a, a duck curve plot for a long time from California ISO, who's been highlighting these issues for quite a while. Uh, in building a, a you know, a, a kind of a futuristic looking picture of what the system might might be, you know, there's a lot of assumptions involved. So this particular slide, the left hand portion of the slide highlights the New England individual state um, renewable portfolio standards, very aggressive for the next 10 years. Folks have asked, well, why does it kind of flatline after that? And I think it's because the states themselves have taken that posture of wait and see. No one's really looked that far. They set an aggressive you know, line in the sand and, and not really thought about where we go from there till we see how we manage the short term. Right hand side shows one of the other issues that New England will have to address in the future. This is the existing tie line capability between New England and its neighbors. About 1400 megawatts, give or take bi directional with the New York ISO, 2250 with our friends from Quebec, and about 1000 bi directional with uh, the Maritime, specifically the province of New Brunswick. And you can, you'll be able to see how that plays into a crystal ball look in the future and some additional slides, uh, building the database to look at a day in the future, the table on the left, the column there 2020 shows the installed nameplate capability of the resources on the system last year. Um, it's, it's higher than what clears in the capacity market because people tend to ask about that. Not all resources take on a capacity obligation in the market. So nameplate will always be a little bit higher. So about 38,000 installed last year. The hydro in this particular table is just the, the run of river. It is the capability of some units to have some daily or weekly pondage. The bulk of the storage number in here is the generation from pump storage. Of that 18,000 or so, I think about 25 of that was battery. The rest of it was all the pump storage facilities. And you can see Onshore wind, offshore wind, that's the first commercial offshore wind facility in the continental United States. 
Now, when you pull all the resources together from all of the various ISO publications and say, where will they be in 2029? That's the second column. Not much of a change on the traditional fossil thermal nuclear side of the house. There's going to be a bunch of retirements, but they're kind of offset by some future combined cycle units that are in the queue. No real movement on hydro. Pretty good kick in storage looking out to 29. It's all battery. It is not any pump storage. Uh, big jump in solar, and that is not just solar. That is solar with hybrid in storage. Uh, slight increase in onshore wind, but the but the the 800 pound gorilla in in the room is offshore. Uh, over 11,000 megawatts of proposed offshore. I would add in that a lot of that is already under contract with some of the various states. So the probability of it getting built is good. And and almost every day when you look out there, there's someone else proposing either an addition to existing proposals or a brand new facility. So the region could literally jump from about 38,000 installed nameplate last year to 56,000 in a period of nine years. The 29 information here does not include that there's also proposals for additional ties to Canada to bring in hydro from Quebec and New Brunswick and the Maritimes. So there could be even more resources on the table that are available to meet load and reserve requirements in New England in 29. Before I look at that last column on the chart, just switch over to the right, just to highlight what the ISO is forecasting for load growth. So their 50-50 summer peak load forecast for the next 10 years is essentially flat. When you account for all the behind the meter resources and energy efficiency, which is very big in New England, um, it's the, the projection is for no low growth over 10 years. So the goal of Nick and I was to kind of put this 2020 crystal ball day together. So in looking at what would be available for resources in the future on a typical spring day, that is the third column on the table. You see a significant reduction in online fossil thermal nuclear, and that's because springtime is traditional maintenance. You know, at least 50% of the fleet will be out for some period of, you know, two to eight weeks doing their annual inspections and overhauls. Hydro, you make the assumption, is right at the stops. The snow is melting, it is spring freshet, and, and hydro is, is going to be at its maximum. I mean, it, they've got to run the water through the facilities. Storage, we made the assumption that all of the pump storage would be at full pump and all of the available batteries would be at full charge. The assumption, it's it's a light load spring day, you're going to have low prices. So everyone would take advantage of that if they are online and have storage capability. There's a slight D rate on, on the solar availability in, in 29 in our example. Uh, ISO New England uses about an 18% capacity factor for onshore wind. We put that in. We also went along with the ISO assumption of 30% availability for the offshore wind. So you may be looking at a typical light load spring day in you know 2029 where there's about 22,000 megawatts of resources on the system bidding into the energy market. And again, this doesn't include any of the ISO New England tie capability with the neighbors. So this is it. This is the this is the future potential, you know, May light load duck curve day in New England. So you see on that on that chart, you see a, a load. You see the load offset by the behind the meter, and then with all the other resources available, there's the potential for excess generation in excess of 11,000 megawatts. And, and that, is, that, is the, that is the genesis of an operational nightmare. Um, the, if you look at the proposed renewables, everybody from the Canadian provinces to the Carolinas, if all of this offshore and all of the other variable goes in, everybody's potentially going to be long at the same time. So it's not like you could take excess energy and, 
sell it to your neighbor because your neighbors are all going to be in the same same boat, you know, that's sinking. It's going to wreak havoc on on doing a security constrained economic dispatch. Things are going to have to be decommitted. Uh, you just can't handle all these resources on the system at the same time. So it's a very suboptimal dispatch and it also raises the specter of congestion. The springtime is also a peak period for doing transmission maintenance. So you may have a kind of a Swiss cheese transmission system. So even with all this excess generation, you could be looking at a system that has pockets of very high prices because of congestion and other pockets with zero or even negative priced energy, depending on how the market is playing out on a given day. So this is, this is kind of, you know, an operational nightmare in the making, if you will. Uh, it's also not just about the megawatts and the megawatt hours. Uh, you know, the industry at large and NERC in particular in, in probably the last five to eight years has really raised the specter of essential reliability services. When we're talking about those ERS, we're talking inertia and primary frequency response to maintain adequate, you know, frequency on the system, dynamic voltage support and reactive power to drive it to, to keep voltages within acceptable bandwidths. Been a lot done lately on short circuit strength and the impact on protection systems and, and especially the older inverters. Um, they don't function well with low short circuit strength. Uh, sadly, you know, the lights do go out every now and then, and we have to have adequate black start and system restoration capability. And then the whole ERS issue of, of reserves and ramping, um, tracking the minute by minute variations in solar and wind, as well as dealing with, you know, a huge change in those variable resources, either because of a weather event or just that evening ramp as solar's coming out and load is coming in. Futuristically speaking, ERS may become scarce. When you look at the traditional providers today, they either may not be in rate and not dispatched, or they may have just up and shuttered the door and said, we're not making any money in this market and it's, it's time to go away. Hydro and, and, and specifically pump storage provides all of the ERS to, to help build a robust system that can be operated within all the requirements and the standards. I think the ESIG market folks and many of the market discussions across the continent have recognized that a lot of the ERS are either undervalued or there's no market at all or there's no market signals for continuing to provide them or enhance the ability to provide more of them or potentially get more of them on the system from kind of a, a greenfield perspective. So there are some, some kind of market issues. I, I don't wanna spend a lot of time on this. The next two slides kind of highlight a lot of the ERS and, and, and Hydro's role. You know, when you look at, you know, primary and, and fast frequency response, Hydro can provide these. There's really no market signals to invest in them. You know, I, I know a lot of work has been done in other areas about procuring more fast frequency response, but it's almost like the market has been dipping its toes in the pond and nobody really wants to jump in yet. Uh, on voltage control, hydro definitely, so those systems, those units all have excitation systems. They can dynamically help regulate voltage and have real and reactive power capability behind it, but it's very locational. And hydro's in, in generally remote areas where you can really use the voltage support. Uh, hydro facilities have the unique ability to function as a synchronous condenser. They can actually be online and provide ERS while not providing real power, not pushing more megawatts into potentially a system that is already at an overgeneration point. There doesn't exist any market signals yet to upgrade excitation systems to become faster, to rework generators, to get more leading and lagging capability, or to make the necessary equipment uh, uh, modifications to operate as a synchronous condenser. Um, inertia, again, you know, we, we have to be able to, to manage the rate of change of frequency when there are significant contingency events. 
Um, people are getting on board with it. You know, when I look around the industry, I see cutting edge stuff being done in areas like ERCOT. You know, they're monitoring it in real time. They're making dispatch decisions based on what they're monitoring. Hydro can obviously contribute because it has inertia in, in online units that are generating. If units can be brought on as synchronous condensers, they can help with the problem. Uh, but again, lack of lack of market signals to to perform necessary modifications or to provide the services is an issue. Uh, system restoration. Um, you've got start. two minutes left. Yep. There's two minutes left. Thanks. Yep. Uh, hydro supported black start and restoration, uh, minimal market structures out there, not really rewarding. How do we keep units in and keep them from bailing from the programs? The regulation and ramping we've talked about hydro can play a, a big role in that and the industry's recognizing it. Again, we're dipping our toes in market products and then short circuit strength. Again, hydro can support all of that, but there's no, there's no financial incentive. You know, to coin the famous phrase from the Jerry Maguire movie, the resources all sit there and say, show me the money. Um, and, and we haven't gotten there yet. Uh, now, hydro going forward, um, you know, how do we get the most out of what we have? How do we address over generation? Uh, what are the problems we may come up and, and bite us? You know, there's no gain without some pain. Uh, a new look at planning, and then how do we pay for it all? So hydro from that standpoint, uh, you know, we have to look at ways to improve the existing facilities. Can we upgrade to make them synchronous condensers? Can we change out governors or excitation or rework generators? Um, can we look at the contribution to stability and reliability in ERS? And then again, how do we go that next quantum leap from traditional pump storage to the variable speed pump storage? Uh, over generation challenge, it is the ultimate storage device on the system right now. Tried and true, 100 year history, and it's a long life expectancy. The, the pump storage in New England was built in the 60s as part of the nuclear build out. They expect to be there for 100 years. And hydro plays well with the other resources, specifically variable resources. It's not like nuclear where it's binary on or off. Um, it, it does a great job of being in the sandbox with everyone else. Constraints on hydro as we start to ask them to do more, especially flexibility, we have to be mindful of physical constraints, mechanical constraints, environmental issues with minimum flow requirements, uh, external constraints. Most hydro units are now a very happy package with recreational hydro use, boating, fishing. When we figure out the pinch points, we have to decide what's the optimal solution to address pinch points and deal with it in a realistic financial manner. Uh, new look at planning. How does the planning process consider things like ERS? And should it be considered in the planning process? How do we take pump storage and make it more than a regional? We make it more of a global solution. If New England builds 4,000 megawatts of pump storage, that inherently may help Quebec or may help New York ISO. So how do we, how do we spread it out as far as the value and how do we spread it out as far as cost compensation? And then going and kind of gold plating it with the variable speed technology that's available. And lastly, to finish it all off, who's paying for it? Um, you know, we have to incentivize some of these ERS, some of the other systematic benefits that hydro and pump storage will bring to the system in the future, um, even the capacity market. As I mentioned, New England has to remain neutral to the types of megawatts it asks for. It's year X, 2000 megawatts. It's like going in and asking for ice cream when you really want vanilla flavored ice cream. And so should the capacity markets be changed to say, we want 2000 megawatts in year X, but we want 1500 of it to be storage and of that 1000 to be hydro. And so all in all, it gets down to the money trail. We have to create a robust money trail to incent, not just hydro, but all resources to become better actors in the future. So with that, Hydro's helping today. Hydro will continue to help in the short term and long term. Pump storage in particular can help us reach decarbonization goals. So with that, I'll turn it over to Debbie. Thank you so much, John. And, uh, and, and thanks for that pitch on Hydro. It's definitely gonna be playing an important role in the future addressing all of these issues with the changing grid. 
Um, I, I'd like to ask the other panelists if they could put their videos on and we could have a bit of a discussion here. Um, and I'd like to ask uh, the audience to uh, put in questions and vote questions up in the slido.com using the ESIG 7 code. And um, there was one thing that we discussed a little bit on our planning call, and that was the social expectations of resource adequacy. Right? If you think about what happened in California, they hadn't had a resource adequacy problem. You know, it was 20 years ago that they had a problem. So that is like a one in 10 or one in 20 year event. Uh, yet that was um, a huge issue. What are, what should be our social expectations for resource adequacy? If we do have a problem once in every 10 years, um, is that acceptable to the public? What are your thoughts on this? Um, maybe I can start. Uh, I do think that customer expectations are changing. Um, you know, when I when we think about it from the Midwest, uh, I think that the magnitude, the duration, and the timing of events is changing. And when customers look at that, they they say, uh, at least to themselves, you know, uh, was this event predictable? Is it something that we knew was coming at us? And what did the utility company do to address that concern? So when we are developing our RA program, as an example, we understand that the magnitude and the timing is different than it used to be uh, due to climate change. I mentioned the event that occurred in June in Portland with 118 degrees, right? That's a, that's a perfect example of a climate change event that was occurring. We set up the reserve sharing program to be able to help one another during that event as well. So I, I think the answer is yes, expectations are changing and we just had to figure out different ways of addressing what those concerns are. SPP is another example of an event where um, they were within their limits of their metrics, but got uh, a lot of questions about what happened. Yeah, Debbie, I'll, I'll add to that. I think in general, there's all different types of reliability on the system. And, you know, frankly, I think we spend too much money on resource adequacy relative to other forms of reliability. If you think of a one day in 10 year uh, and you lose 5% of load per se, that one day in 10 years, and you randomly roll that across the system, it's, you know, once every 200 years for any individual customer. And I think, you know, given that you can have events that are relatively short duration. You can roll them across the system and, and even impact people even less. I do think we end up paying too much for resource adequacy when we could allocate, you know, additional, additional funds to other forms of reliability, like distribution reliability, which affects people quite a bit more. And especially when we think about resiliency it could be more important, more money probably towards cybersecurity and, and reliability in that context. So I think, Ultimately, I think Russ has a good comment in, in one of his questions about putting, making, increasing transparency on costs and what people are paying for reliability. Because I think most people don't know what they're paying to each type of reliability, not even individuals, let alone, you know, large, large users and the utilities themselves. Yeah, I, I add in from an operational perspective, um, people are not patient. They will not tolerate outages. They will not tolerate long duration outages without essentially, you know, they want heads to roll. So, um, the expectation of society in this country is, is a very high level of reliability and finding the balancing act between upgrading facilities, adding facilities. And, and hardening facilities to improve resiliency is, is a tough balancing act because the consumers also have to bear the rate increase. And I don't think, as was just pointed out, I don't think they connect the dots that says, yeah, you want this level of reliability, but there's an inherent cost and are you willing to pay for it? Um, I also think going forward, it's not going to get any better. You know, the, the way society is, is morphing is, you know, people expect 100% reliability. Uh, so I don't know how that's going to happen. I think the transition to the renewables as part of decarbonization is going to introduce new risks that at least operationally we haven't got our hands around yet. And so the, the problem may get worse before it gets better. Mm -hmm. 
Keith, did you want to add anything to this? Oh, I'll, I'll try. I, I, I think that the that there's long been a, a social compact between people and the utility, uh, you know, because we provide monopoly service often, and, and that and, and that those expectations are around reliable service, and that the entire economy is around that high level of reliability. And and while I really like the idea that Derek was bringing up about, you know, you know. Really, what, what is the true impact to the customer? You know, it's like a one in 200 year rolling outage because we didn't have enough generation supply and that they're probably way more likely to be impacted by, you know, a down feeder because of weather events and, you know, the, and, and the distribution system. I really like that. Um, so I think that that conversation hasn't really started. And I, I think especially in light of renewables and, and the new type of reliability constructs we have, that I, I think that that starting to level set expectations around, you know, that that if you're going to have a system that's heavily on wind and solar, that you may be able to save quite a bit if you are able to extract more demand response out of the system, and that and and so think and so that would mean, you know, potentially using that demand side, maybe a voluntary program at first maybe a limited amount of duration, you know, so to, 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 count, to, to conceive the sort of rolling concept that Derek was bringing up. I just don't think right now that you, you can't just switch it and then just start shutting people off, right? There has to be a program put in place, you know, that says look, the expectation is that we're going to provide you mostly reliable service, and we're going to go from like 100% standard to like a 99% standard. And that in that, you may be able to save quite a bit of money. But that's a conversation that has to start now. And I think it'd be a good time to do it, considering the cost of that final mile on the generation side, you know, the one event in 10-year type reliability that we've, we've done so to date. That's my comments. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, that that's very insightful. I I agree. And, and, and as Derek mentioned, that this kind of links into a question that Russ Philbrick had posed, which is that the existing metrics um, that we have for resource adequacy assume that a shortage is priced at the value of lost load. And as you mentioned, with load participation, the value of service and the value to customers and value to customers varies, the value to customers matters. And should we have price based metrics? And I don't know if anyone else wants to comment on on this idea of having price based metrics. I'll I'll go to the other questions on the slide before I have to answer that one. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think in a perfect world, the economist inside me says if we have you know real time pricing, time of uh, you know, time of use rates. There really is no RA construct needed, right? People can pay for the reliability that they want. I think the reality of it is you have to be careful about how you implement those things and make sure people are knowledgeable about the rates and things like that. But I do think for certain customers, absolutely, like ex expose them to price and they can pay for the reliability that they want. Um, that's a huge step forward. I do think getting more load flexibility makes the reliability question less of a black and white we're either reliable or we're not and more of an economic decision i think the more we can move in that direction the better okay thanks derek um michael hill from burke asks as we move toward an energy constrained future does not properly compensating energy adequacy pose a barrier to deploying long duration energy storage so the fact that we're not properly compensating energy adequacy um, create a barrier to things like you know, pumped hydro yeah. and others. Yeah, so this this idea of energy adequacy is something that sort of came out of the work that Kent did, and and that how there is a point at which you know there is this sort of like well well if you did go with an all storage system or something close to it like like how how much more storage energy storage would you need? on the sort of energy adequacy question to ensure that you get through the, you know, a winter doldrums period of, you know, cloudy, you know, lacking wind for you know, like a week, which, which happened in Colorado. You know, I, I, I don't know 
I, I, I think that, first of all, you'd have to actually have that metric of energy adequacy, and it would sort of be like this lame metric initially because we're, you know, currently at a more traditional-based system, we're sort of flush with energy. You know, it's more about can you deliver it to people's homes? Can you actually get the fuel out of the ground? Those have been sort of the recent, you know, the recent phenomena. I do think that it is an interesting question about, you know, if you're going to be having a system based largely on energy limited resources, what is the energy adequacy? You know, because this is we often talk in this RA, it's almost inevitably talking about capacity, right? But but it's you know the the flip side has been this energy adequacy, which we don't we have no metrics at all. So I I think that it's an interesting question. Um, I don't know how to. Uh, I think ultimately it's going to be a whether it's long duration storage or whether you know it's some you know just overbuild of existing um, you know uh, variable and uh, variable resources. I, I think it would probably tip to the latter rather than you know massive amounts of long duration storage. That's just my humble opinion. But you'd actually have to know how how much more do you need. You know. Anyway, I'll stop there. I think Derek probably has something to say on that. Derek, you want to add to that? Yeah, I'm happy for Alice to chime in as well. I, I do think we could make an improvement with something like EUE that would you know start to favor more kind of the energy constraints of the systems and, and accurately reflect that. That's one step. I mean, I, I wouldn't say we're not uh, compensating energy adequacy correctly today, but in the we just don't have that long duration need yet, right? It's just a matter of when that comes. Today, I mean, to be frank, I view the natural gas system today is what we're relying on for long duration storage. How long we keep that around for is going to dictate when we need to start, you know, paying for long duration storage resources in my view. I think the, the wild card in all of this, um, which introduces so many variables that I don't know how we get our hands around it is where does this country go? with the decarbonization effort as far as electrifying society. Because right now, everybody pretty much is forecasting very low load growths for long periods of time. It's not just ISO New England. And if you start converting all of transportation, all of heating, and it all goes electric, it's going to really skewer what we've been looking at in that, you know, I've heard numbers that double or triple the demand for energy from where it is today. And so that that introduces, you know, you just throw everything out the window and start from scratch because that's a whole new world. Good point. Greg, did you, was there anything you wanted to add? Uh, we did take a look at energy uh, as part of our program. And, and to be honest, we put that in the parking lot for right now because we're, we're setting up a capacity program. And uh, as everybody mentioned, we did a review and there are no energy capacity programs that we could find when we took a look at them. For our resources in the Northwest, obviously large hydro, and I'm talking hydro that has one year's worth of storage. Uh, we do need to take a look at that and we do anticipate uh, evaluating that as part of our program in the future, but not right now. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm realizing that we've gone over time, um, and I, I would like to thank our panelists for these great contributions, the discussion, and thank all of you in the audience for your participation. It's been a really useful set of presentations on the evolutionary thinking on resource adequacy and the impact of storage. And um, just as a reminder to everyone, we're going to follow up with written questions, written answers to the questions that we didn't get to. There were a lot of questions. I'm sorry. Um, I'd also like to remind everyone workshop sessions are Tuesdays and Thursdays throughout October. So we've got a great session next Tuesday on evolving system planning considerations, including DERs and Obadiah Bartholomew of SMUD is going to chair that. Uh, there's no charge. Everybody's invited to attend. Just go to esig.energy and register. And thank you again to all the panelists and participants and stay safe. We look forward to seeing you again on Tuesday. Thank you so much. Thank you.